Good evening, everybody. It's, gr it's great to see you all here. I know that um, I was chatting to, to the, uh, the organizers earlier, and I know that most people ticked a panel, and then some people didn't take anything and were, were you know, uh, the choice was made for you. But I'm going to assume that uh, most of you here uh, most of you here want to be here in the climate panel, um, but I'll, I'll, maybe, uh, I'll maybe say something that is a bit strange for a moderator to say, which is that uh, I, I, I could see why some people might not choose the climate panel, because sometimes we think climate talks are going to be depressing. But I can assure you that the group we have here this evening are a group of doers, very much in the spirit of St. Bridget and, and all of the different jobs that we've heard from Derville and others this evening that St. Bridget uh, had uh, and did uh, in terms of uh, managing 15,000 nuns and, and freeing slaves and you know, farming and all these different things. Uh, so I think what, what we have this evening in a panel is, is you know, not just talking about the, the obvious big problems that we have in the climate, although I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that, but what people are doing and specifically what these four incredible women are actually doing uh, about it. And, and we'll definitely have uh, an opportunity uh, for you all uh, to, to ask questions. So feel free to be, just be saving up anything you'd like to ask uh, or, or, or tell us about uh, after a little while. Uh, so my name is Sinead Walsh. Uh, I'm the head of climate for the Department of Foreign Affairs. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really great to, to see, uh, see such a packed house. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll have each of, of the panelists uh, talk a little bit uh, about themselves, you know, what, how, they, how they got into all of this, uh, what they're doing now, um, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll have a bit of a chat and, and we'll, hear, we'll hear from all of you as well. Um, so I'm going to start uh, with, with Fiona Harvey, who's uh, I think probably known to, to many of you, uh, who's a Guardian uh, environment correspondent um, and has been working exclusively on environmental issues since 2004, which I think we can all agree. It's tough going, it's tough going and shows real, <laughs> real resilience. Uh, but many of you, like me, you, you probably uh, read a lot of uh, Fiona's work. Uh, she writes about the environment both uh, here uh, in, in uh, the UK as well as uh, internationally. Um, she's written on pretty much everything you can imagine from air pollution, biodiversity. She's interviewed David Attenborough, Gorbachev, you know, all, all, all sorts of uh, incredible uh, figures, uh, and she's uh, won quite a few awards, including twice uh, winning the Foreign Press Association Award uh, for Environment Story of the Year and the British Environment and Media Awards Journalist of the Year. Uh, so I think, um, Fiona, you, you, you come uh, uh, with an enormous amount of, uh, of knowledge and insight, uh, including uh, having been to 15 COPs, so, so many Many people will have, uh, will have maybe attended or certainly uh, and heard a lot about the COP15 in, in Glasgow, which, which a few of us were, were at. Um, and uh, I can just only imagine, after all the exhaustion uh, from, from those two weeks in Glasgow, how it must feel <coughs> to go to 15 of those. So you have so much to tell us, uh, Fiona. And uh, uh, so maybe, maybe I'll just start by asking you to tell us a little bit about how you got into to all of this and, and uh, yeah, a little bit about what it is you're doing uh, at the moment. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for that very kind introduction there, Jeanette. Um, and yeah, it, uh, that was my, my 15th COP, was, uh, was COP26. Um, and in many ways it was the, it was the best one yet. Um, because although, uh, you know, as you say, uh, people can tend to get very depressed uh, about the environment and about uh, climate change in particular. Um, actually, I was made quite optimistic by COP26, and I'll tell you why. Um, the, the impression that a lot of people had uh, afterwards was that it was a, a failure because we didn't come out of the meeting in Glasgow last November uh, with a fully-fledged plan uh, to how we were going to tackle climate change and uh, you know, set everything to rights. Um, and that's right, we didn't. But we did come out with uh, a very good uh, way forward. Um, and after years of meeting annually uh, for these COPs, um, that's actually great progress. Because when you consider what we have to do uh, for the climate, it's huge. Um, climate change affects the whole world, and we're seeing it now. 
Um, we're seeing extreme weather, we're seeing flooding, we're seeing droughts, uh, and, and so on. All these things that, you know, when I started writing about this in 2004, were all predicted for the future. We're seeing it happening around us, so there's no doubt there of what's going on. Um, but we have, we have taken a long time to, to solve it, and the reason for that is that everything really in the modern world uh, is related to fossil fuels. All that we see around us, um, these beautiful surroundings in the MBC, uh, you know, you, however you're going to get home tonight, uh, when everything that you see when you walk down the street, everything that you do in your everyday life is put there by fossil fuels in one way or another. Um, and the entire global economy is based on fossil fuels. So taking us away from that and putting us on a path where we would no longer emit carbon, where we would get to net zero carbon, is a massive undertaking because it involves everything. It involves every aspect of our lives, every aspect of the economy, not just how we generate energy and uh, uh, electricity and heat our homes or so on, though that's massive, but also how we grow our food, how we move around, uh, you know, all of the, the products and services and so on um, that we use every day. So when you consider it like that, when you consider how huge the problem is, and also how many people make money from the status quo, from the vested interests, from this entire global economy that has built up over centuries to be based on fossil fuels, when you consider how massive that, that task is to take that money away from those people, um, then I think you, you, you can realise what we're engaged on here uh, and how difficult that is and how, in fact, we have made a great deal of progress. Because when I started doing this in 2004, renewable electricity was incredibly expensive, far more expensive than fossil fuels. Uh, electric vehicles that in those days uh, were pretty much useless. You know, there, uh, a tiny number of people had them. You know, you couldn't get very far. They weren't much help to anyone. Um, if you wanted to decarbonize your home, uh, you didn't have many options. Um, if you wanted to, to get around from, from A to B, uh, you know, you, you were dependent on, on airplanes and, and, you know, fossil fuel uh, driven vehicles. It, it was really very, very difficult then. We now are in a situation where we've got an energy price crisis that's based on the price of gas, which shows you that um, actually if we went for renewable energy, we would all be a great deal better off. Renewable energy is now cheaper to produce from wind and sun uh, than to use gas and other fossil fuels. Um, if you look at the technology that we have now, so much of it has come on in leaps and bounds. If you look at people's lives now, people are much more willing, I think, especially young people, to make differences in their lives, the kinds of differences that we have to make, such as, for instance, eating less meat uh, and, you know, being more aware of what we consume, what we buy, not going for fast fashion and things like that. So if you consider the progress that we've made, it really is astonishing. And what we did at COP26 was progress as well, because the Paris Agreement we had in 2015 uh, set out how we should limit global warming to 1.5 or 2 degrees uh, above uh, pre-industrial levels. Now, that might not seem like a lot of difference. You couldn't tell uh, in this room if it was 1.5 or 2 degrees hotter. But actually, when it comes to the climate, it, it makes a massive uh, difference. Every fraction of a degree, we know now, that we heat the world further above 1.5. It takes us further and further away from a stable climate. So everything that we can save, every, every fraction of a degree that we can hold temperatures down by is incredibly valuable. Um, so that difference in Paris talking about two degrees to now talking about 1.5 degrees um, is actually a great deal of progress. The other thing we agreed in Paris is that countries would come back every five years with a plan for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, every five years turns out not to be soon enough when you're talking about a problem that we really have about 10 years to solve. So what we agreed in uh, COP26 in Glasgow, as well as targeting 1.5 instead of 2 degrees, we agreed to come back every year uh, to talk about new plans for bringing down greenhouse gas emissions. The other thing we achieved was that no one before Glasgow, um, people were not talking about net zero, really. Um, 
when we, when we started the preparations for COP26, uh, only a tiny number of countries were looking at uh, targeting net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Now it's about 90% uh, of countries uh, have a target in place to do net zero emissions. Now they don't all have a plan for how they're going to achieve that target, but at least now they have a target. So when you look at all that, I think actually you can see that we have made a great deal of progress uh, in the last few years on this uh, enormous problem, and that actually we do have reasons to be optimistic. And I think it's very, very important to be optimistic because it's very easy for people to slip into this oh, defeatist, oh, what can we do, oh, it's all too hard, oh, we're on the road to, to nowhere, there's no point. It's very, very hard for people to, to get out of that slump once they're in it. So I would prefer to try and keep people focused on the progress we've made and the possibilities of progress. Because when we started out, when I started out in 2004, we were headed for a six degree world, which would be absolutely catastrophic. When we got to uh, Paris, we were still heading from Paris in 2015 to a three degree world. Now we're focused on a 1.5 degree world and we can get there. It's going to be very, very hard, but we can get there. So that's what I would see as progress um, and really a reason for us all to be hopeful. Thank you. And Theon, I think you're... Uh <laughs> I think you're, 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 you're avoiding your own role in all of this. I don't think there's too many journalists uh, who've been writing full time on environment since 2004. And I don't imagine that in 2004 at the Financial Times, you were, you know, employee of the month uh, in terms of, of the messages that, that you were bringing. So I, I think uh, that there's a, that there's a huge amount of, uh, of, of, I think, how you yourself have, have contributed to, to the progress that, that you're talking yeah. about. Um, I, I wanted, Beth, to, to turn to you um, because you, you were also at, at COP26, and I, I'd love to get your, your take on that. Um, but just, just to, to, to introduce Beth, um, so Beth uh, Doherty's uh, 18, he's still 18, unbelievable. Uh, from my home to actually also from North, North Dublin, uh, like, like myself, North Sider. Um, and, and Beth, you've been or involved in, in, um, in climate activism, in climate strikes, in Fridays for Future, uh, both nationally and, and internationally on, on, you know, very much with a climate uh, justice and education focus. Um, you attended the climate a case in the Supreme Court hearing uh, in July 2020, which was very significant, um, and you've been the sustainability officer for for the second level uh, students union, um, and, and of course you you, you were recently at COP. Um, so yeah, I'd love to hear your your take, Beth, and how how you feel. I mean, your your generation, um, you know, is 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 really in in the front line of all of this, um, and uh, yeah, it'd be really good to hear where you're where you're coming from and uh, what your thoughts are. Yeah, I mean, I guess for COP, um, I think there was kind of a couple of things that came out of it in terms of young people's perspectives. Um, and I think the first thing was the systemic level of the crisis. And I think like just to kind of carry on from Fiona in a way, like kind of how the climate crisis is fully integrated into every single sector of society. Um, and I think that was really indicated at COP26 because I think when my generation was growing up, um, it was very much, you know, um, reduce, reuse, recycle, the polar bears are fine, they're very far away, but they're not like, you know, bad things are happening, but don't worry about it, be grand. Um, and obviously that's not the case. Um, and I think as we grew up, we kind of realised how truly built into our systems it was. And I think COP26 really indicated that to myself and like the other young people that were attending with me. Um, in particular, in terms of how much fossil fuel lobbying, fossil fuel influence is built into the international structures. And I think when you look at that, I think the reaction of a lot of the young activists at COP26, the ones I was staying with, the ones at protests and things, was sometimes a sense of disillusionment and a sense of disheartenment and a feeling... Um, you know, I have friends who've been working on it since they were 13, which is just incredibly young, um, to get involved with it. And I think there is kind of a sense of frustration and anger amongst, couple, amongst young people um, when we're looking at, you know, 2030, when I won't have turned 30 yet, those kind of things. And I think that sense was there, but I also think there was an incredible sense of hope at COP26. And I think that is also important to note because we can look at, you know, the disillusionment, the disheartenment that young people felt with the structures that we have. But I think there was times at the protests, at COP26 in particular, when it felt like a street festival. Um, and when you had young people from all over the world coming together in the streets. And I think 
one of the biggest things with climate change is imagining what a world beyond the fossil fuel industry looks like, imagining what the world actually looks like when we move away from these structures. And I think that's where imagination is absolutely crucial. And I think the imagination we saw with young people and everyone coming together in the streets and in rallies and in protests was what community can look like and what the world can look like if we actually do take climate action and climate justice at the core. And I think it is so important that we keep that hope and that imagination and that spirit when we're talking about climate. And I think that was alongside some of the disappointments, but also the progress made at COP26. I think that feeling of hope and the fact that we are still in the last 10 years where we can make a difference was one of the biggest takeaways for me as well. Mm. No, and I think, um, thanks Beth. And, and, and I think, you know, it, it's been so significant, you know, people like yourself speaking to your parents, speaking to your aunts and uncles and so on. I mean, there's so many people who will say, I started taking climate more seriously because my daughter, my nephew, and so on, you know, kind of came home from school or came home from a strike and said, you know, uh, you know, how are you? Know, there's so many ways in which our parents are, you know, want to do everything for us, right, and leave us with the best possible world. And then there's there's this, which is so incredibly fundamental, and and the youth movement in, in recent years has been so uh, so extraordinary. Um, and I think you've touched on something else, which is so key, which is that. You know, you talk about imagining, imagining what's possible. I think we've all experienced over the last two, almost exactly two years that all sorts of things that were impossible suddenly became possible. Um, and I think we, we need to really take advantage of this moment um, you know, and, and challenge ourselves and challenge our leaders. Well, hang on a second, it also wasn't possible to totally transform society when we needed to for COVID, but we found a way. And so how do we get that urgency? Um, and I think you know, the, the activism of yourself and, and, and your colleagues is, is such a huge part of, of getting that message across. Because as you said, Fiona, it's not in the future, it's now. Um, I, I wanna turn uh, to you even because uh, you're, you're very much uh, one of these uh, doers and, and uh, you know, looking at, at how how the private sector, uh, yourself and, and Katie, is, um, is influencing all of this. Uh, even uh, is the co-founder of a company called Food Cloud, which is um, uh, focused very much on, um, on food waste. Uh, and she's also a partnerships director. Uh, food Cloud has won all sorts of awards and, and even has won um, all sorts of uh, business and, and social enterprise um, awards. Um, and it, uh, you'll, you'll talk more even about the company, but I think one of the things that's really striking is it's not just about uh, what Food Cloud has managed to do in Ireland, it's also how Food Cloud's you know, uh, solutions and innovations for food waste is, is traveling to, to the UK and, and to many other um, countries. So I'd love to hear more uh, about that even and, and how, I mean, food waste is obviously such a really big uh, part of the challenge here and, and how are you how are you uh, tackling it uh, would be yeah. great to hear. Um, so I suppose to set the context um, you know there, as Fiona said every aspect of what we do is you know has to change and the food system contributes about thir over 30 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions um, and within that we actually waste latest figures are pushing the numbers up but we waste about 30 percent of food that's produced and it accounts for about 8% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so if food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions after the US and China. So food, you know, obviously if you waste food, you're wasting all of the resources that are going to produce that and, and needlessly. Um, so what we try to do at Food Cloud is play you know, a small part in trying to solve that problem. Um, so we've developed two solutions. So the first one is a technology platform that allows retailers to redistribute food that they have in their, lo in their own stores to local community groups. Um, and we started uh, back in 2012 with one donation from a farmer's market in Glasnevin in Dublin. Um, but got Tesco on board in 2013 um, with a store in inner city Dublin and I suppose uh, that was the big break in terms of getting uh, a large retailer on board um, and since then I suppose how it works in reality is every day there's stuff going to waste in a supermarket uh, using our technology platform uh, the store manager can upload details of what's available and that sends out a notification to local community groups who go to the store and pick it up directly from the store 
So what's really exciting about it is it's a very local solution to what is a really global problem. So it's your store manager and your local um, community groups working together to solve each other's problems. And I suppose reimagining the future is actually trying to figure out how we can all work together, whatever way, wherever we're working within our communities. Um, and with that solution, we scaled across Ireland initially and got did get buy-in from all of the retailers um, eventually, um, and now have uh, worked with similar NGOs in the UK, and Maud and Emma, who lead that, are here in the front row. Um, so we work with uh, an NGO, a food redistribution organization in the UK, and really they had were already doing this, but what we gave was access to technology, so allowing them to work with retailers as well. And similarly, in the Czech Republic and Slovakia, where basically through partnerships with existing NGOs, we can help them to increase their impact. So sharing that technology that we've developed in Ireland with global communities. Um, and then I suppose a lot of wasted, but a lot of food is wasted earlier in the supply chain. So before it even gets to the supermarket. Um, so in 2015, we set up three warehouses, one in Galway, one in Tala, where Anna's from, uh, <laughs> one in uh, Cork and we redistribute large volumes. So that's from farmers right through for, to Nestle, Kellogg's. Um, you have to tell them about the carrots. Yeah, yeah. well, I'm a bit obsessed with the carrots. Um, so there is like waste at every step of supply chain. So the warehouses then deal with the supply chain and redistribute out to community groups across Ireland through the warehouses. But the carrots, do you want me to tell you? Yeah, I do, I do. We've been hearing about the carrots. It's fascinating. <laughs> They're laughing because I haven't stopped talking about the carrots. Um, so I suppose in Ireland, we last year we redistributed about 3,000 tonnes of food. Um, that represents about 0.33% of the food that's actually wasted in Ireland. So I suppose while we're proud of what we've achieved, we've got all the retailers on board, we've got 600 community groups, it's really still like a drop in the ocean in terms of what needs to change. Um, and I suppose what we're trying to do is figure out where and why surplus is wasted and what are the opportunities and our vision is for a world where no good food goes to waste. And what does that actually look like? Um, so one of the projects we've initiated is working with growers to figure out how much, why is so much food wasted at farm level? Um, so ultimately, um, like ter like we, I was at Ireland with a, grow a carrot grower in Kilkenny on Friday and they harvest it, but 60% of what comes in to the pack house, or 40% of what comes in is actually lost. And it's lost because it's too big for the plastic packaging that we bought it in. It's broken. Um, it looks a bit funny. It might have a little bit of scarring on it. And ultimately, it means that he has to actually produce 40% more, which involves land use, water, fertilizer, everything, to produce enough to make his yield. And it is kind of considered a cost of doing business. So for us to reimagine a world where no good food goes to waste, it's from home right down through farm, but there's opportunities within it. He was so excited to have me down and be like, I was thinking we could do this. I brought this product back from the UK. Do you see what they're doing here? It's actually, you know, amazing the potential opportunities there are. And I suppose one of the things, and I think it's why we have a great team as well, is one of the things about uh, climate is it can be overwhelming. But with food, it's actually something that is really like delicious. So it's something that you can take action on three times a day in your own home. But like it does need to be wider than that. It needs to be what's happening at each step of the supply chain. Um, but we have found that if consumers don't care, retailers don't care and supply chain doesn't care. So it is important for everybody to take action on it. Um, and like I suppose what continues to inspire us is the opportunity the opportunity in the carrots, the opportunity in bringing people together, um, and the opportunity that food provides in actually sharing, you know, all our important moments, even over the last two years, they're always over food. And it's something that has to change, but it doesn't have to be negative. It can be done in a very positive way, but like a lot of things need to change. So we're taking, you know, a small part of the problem and trying to see maximize the potential of what we're doing mm. and hoping that it will inspire change in other actors along the supply chain. Mm. And, and I think it's, it, it, it's, it's a great linkage, uh, to Katie, to, to what you do mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. you, know, you talk about 
how fundamental food is, well, something else that's very fundamental is, is clothes, right? We all wear clothes every day. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm not gonna, you know, <laughs> <laughs> as far as we know. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's something that's very, very close to home. Uh, so uh, that's, that's the area that, that Katie is, is working on uh, tackling. Uh, Katie is, is Irish born, Newry, uh, as, as, as far as, as I remember. And uh, by the way, Fiona's Belfast, but she hasn't seen the movie, so there's no point asking her about it. But uh, some, some of us have seen the movie, so uh, we can chat about that later on. Um, but, but Katie um, uh, has studied uh, in, in Westminster, um, and uh, I, I was reminded a little bit of what Anna was saying, because worked in London with Alexander McQueen and Mark Jacobs in New York, and even I, who have absolutely no consciousness of fashion, even I know uh, I've heard of those, of those very distinguished uh, individuals. Um, and then just a year after graduating, uh, Katie uh, presented her debut uh, collection um, and is, is also uh, an award winner, uh, having, having received the, the, the Middle Moda Absolute Prize. Um, um, and I think, you know, the, the link really to, uh, to, to, to what Evan was saying um, is this um, ethos, uh, Katie, that your company has on local local uh, local production and, and sustainability and, and waste and um, so it'd be great to, to hear a bit more uh, about that and uh, and what 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 inspired you I, I'm conscious you had a, a family uh, connection that inspired you as well so we'd love to hear about yeah. that so from what the other women are saying tonight it's very difficult for me to sit here and but little things that everyone can change about who you're buying and where you're buying it from and who makes it makes a big difference it's like at home how we recycle you have to be a little bit more conscious nowadays and although i'm a small brand and we make small little changes it all adds up to the bigger picture so just in terms of like we make everything here in the uk we use local tradesmen our craft people seamstresses we source our fabric from the UK, we do a lot of it ourselves. So we have like no import and export of materials. We're not going to Italy, we're not shipping stuff to Portugal, so our carbon footprint is really low. For us, this is a really big deal, because um, in fashion, you'd go to other countries for a cheaper product. So pre-COVID, we were doing uh, presentations and collections of London Fashion Week. And after COVID, we took a step back and we kind of were thinking that fashion cycle is really vicious. It's really hard to keep up and we're constantly throwing stuff in people's faces. Therefore, you would have a lot of dead stock or your production's higher, you're making more clothing, you're making more collections. So now we've taken a step back and we produce only what we want and what we need. Therefore, we cut everything ourselves. There's no scrap going to waste. And if there's scrap, they're going into face masks. Like little things that we do to keep like the big, to help the big picture. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to just kind of keep knuckling down and keep going forward with little things. For small brands, it's difficult to have a big impact, but for the bigger brands, we need to like also push them to have a bigger impact. Um, so yeah. Yeah. No, I, I I think that's I think that's amazing, um, Katie, because uh, you know I, I you know I, I was listening to something a while ago, and it was talking you know this is constant debate in the climate world about individual action versus systemic change, and some people say, well, what's the point in me? going vegan, what's the point in me, you know, buying an electric car or whatever, you know, if uh, China, if the US and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, I, I listened to, to a woman talking about this and I thought, you know, it, it, it resonates with what you're saying, you know, and she was sort of saying, you know, okay, does it make a difference if, if you know, we do individual actions? Okay, you know, yes, but, but it's very small. But the difference to us doing individual actions and and other people knowing that, and then maybe they also do it, or in your case, you know, the bigger brands, and, and we're seeing this, mm -hmm. the bigger brands are put under pressure. Mm -hmm. Well, hang on a second, now our customers are starting to say, well, they can do it, you know, and, and I think this is where your influence becomes so much larger than possibly you may even know, you, you know, because you won't always necessarily know when those, those linkages are being made, but I think that the power of, um, you know, of, of the, the, you know, and we can see it, I think, in Ireland and in the UK, 
Um, you know, there's so many more food options now. There's so many more sustainable options mm -hmm. because people were asking for it, but they only asked for it. It links a little bit to what you said, Fiona. They only asked for it because they started to see that it was possible. So, you know, there's more demand, there's more supply, and that and that is really creating this this virtual circle. So I think um, I think I think that's so important.